Hello, a very good evening. Welcome to you all. Uh, we're keeping the door open because some people might be late. I don't want to miss the program. Um, good to see you all here. Uh, my name is Puk van Dijk. I'm your moderator for tonight. Um, and welcome at It's All Graphic. It's our second edition. Activism and graphic design is what we're going to talk about tonight. Good evening. Hello. <laughs> Um, it's All Graphic is a biannual program, so this is our second edition, the next one will be in about half a year. Um, that is in close collaboration with the Wim Kraul Institute. And for those who don't know the Wim Kraul Institute, it's, uh, it organizes the sharing of knowledge uh, of graphic design heritage, or our graphic design heritage, for future generations. Uh, and is based in the Special Collections Building here in Amsterdam. Um, tonight, activism and graphic design is what we're going to talk about. Uh, the power of visual communication as a tool for making change and transformation in our society. We have some great guests here tonight. Um, and before we go into the program, just wanted to point out that you found a little catalog on your seat. A yellow little book. Um, which was a part of the exhibition, The Design of Descent. Uh, that was a part of uh, Graphic Matters Festival in Breda, which was in September until October the 22nd. Um, but really nice booklet to see uh, what the exhibition was about. And it gives a good overview on graphic activism from the 60s until about now. About the program tonight, um, it'll be in English. Um, and there will be, after each guest, a little bit of time for your questions. So if you have questions, even if your English is not that well, but you have a question in Dutch, feel free to point up your hand, your finger, and then uh, I'll just translate it for you. So that's fine. First, we will start off with uh, designer Lies Ros, who will be interviewed by designer Chris Vermaas. Uh, and they were gonna, they're going to talk about her time at Wildplakken. Then uh, designers Roosje Klap, uh, Raoul, Raoul Balay and Yuri Veerman will present their work. And then Ruben Pater will close off the evening with a column. Um, to start off, we kind of uh, went deep into the archives to get you all in a certain activistic mood. Um, and we're going to show you a very short film, or at least a part of a film, uh, that's called In a Tank Kun Je Niet Leven, of Kun Je Niet Wonen. Uh, it's filmed on, on a Super 8 camera, and it's about the squatting movement in Amsterdam in the late 70s, beginning of 80s. But it's in Dutch, unfortunately, unfortunately but, uh, but the images are very cool. So uh, let's start that. I stand here because I want to see that I'm behind Johannes, who is cracked and who sits al, uh, al weken lang in arrest. And uh, I want to see everyone see that I'm behind Johannes. Sta. Uh, ik heb met erg veel plezier uh, een aantal jaren geleden gezien hoe die kraakbeweging zich ontzettend creatief en met, met ontzettende goede motiveringen uh, ging ontwikkelen. Hoe ze ontzettende leuke acties hebben gedaan zonder enig geweld. Ik heb ook gezien hoe daar met geweld op gereageerd werd en hoe er een steeds grotere escalatie kwam. Die is niet begonnen bij de krakers, die is begonnen bij het wettig gezag. Dat de krakers nu zich willen gaan verdedigen tegen dat soort aanvallen kan ik me goed voorstellen. We staan hier nou vreedzaam te demonstreren. Als ze hier op ons gaan inrijden of wat dan ook, ik weet niet wat ik doe hoor. Dat kan je toch niet aan laten leunen allemaal, dat is toch te gek. Leven we hier nou in een politiestaat of leven we hier in een rechtsstaat? Nou, daar wil ik toch nog wel even voor vechten zien. jaar welvaartsstaat heeft geen einde kunnen maken aan de woningnood. Grote groepen van de bevolking wonen in slechte of te kleine huizen. En hoewel de overheid het woonrecht van jongeren erkend heeft, komen zij al helemaal niet aan de bak. Er is geen geld, geen grond, maar vooral geen politieke wil om wonen als een prioriteit te zien. Steden verkrotten, panden worden sloopreip gemaakt. Speculanten verdienen grof geld aan de schaarse woonruimte. In plaats van betaalbare woningen 
worden er dure kantoren en luxe appartementen gebouwd. Protesten van de bevolking en acties voor een ander woonbeleid lopen stuk op de nietszeggende beloften van de autoriteiten. Het enige waar de Amsterdamse volksvesting op dit moment geen gebrek aan heeft, dat is aan woningzoekenden. Je kunt zeggen dat van elke zes Amsterdamse huishoudens op dit moment er één op zoek is naar een woning. Ik zou zeggen hierbij, in de hoop dat u er snel en effectief iets mee doet, ons ijspakket en onze brief aan het rij. Dank u. Um, het is denk ik dan ook uh, niet de vraag of je dit soort situaties moet aanpakken. Het is de vraag hoe je ze moet aanpakken. En ik ben uh, op ieder moment bereid om daarover te praten. En ik beschouw dit als een onderdeel van dat gesprek. En ik uh, denk dat ik dat alleen maar kan besluiten met te zeggen dat ik hoop dat op dat punt, zowel waar het de gang van zaken in Amsterdam betreft, als waar het betreft onze, denk ik, krachtige stellingname in Den Haag. Ik hoop dat het gemeentebestuur van Amsterdam dat zal kunnen doen. Niet tegenover de groepen die me dit stuk hebben aangeboden, maar naast en tezamen met de groepen die me dit stuk hebben aangeboden. Dank u. Ik wil iemand aan de op het moment dat Paul de deur open doet, en dat is duidelijk zichtbaar, rijdt hij zijn wagen weg en stapt de barricadeploeg, en dat zijn zes mensen, die stappen naar buiten toe en die lopen naar het pand toe. Eind jaren 60 wordt er voor het eerst gekraakt. Sindsdien zijn er duizenden leegstaande huizen aan de woningvoorraad toegevoegd. In het begin worden vooral dichtgespijkerde panden gekraakt. Door de verkeerde aanpak van de stadsvernieuwing zouden deze jarenlang leeg blijven staan. Langzamerhand gaan krakers zich ook richten op grotere en duurdere panden. Deze huizen lenen zich uitstekend om in groepen te wonen. Kraken biedt zo de mogelijkheid te experimenteren met andere manieren van leven. Maar of je nu in een groep of alleen woont, onzeker blijft het. While I was looking at this, this uh, uh, short film, it kind of reminds me of the time we are living in right now, where we're also uh, in this uh, real estate bubble. Um, and you can see that activism maybe also uh, will, uh, will get his grip on that. Um, let's stay in this, uh, in this era, in the era of the 70s, late 70s, beginning of 80s. Um, and to stay there, I would like to invite Lise Roos on stage. Uh, and also Chris Vermaas. Um, Lise Ross is one of the three founders of Wildplakken, a collective, a designer's collective from Amsterdam, um, who began in the late 70s and successfully integrated uh, political activism and graphic design. And uh, Chris Vermaas will kind of uh, take us together with Lise, take us back to this time uh, and talk about her work then and uh, the activism or the activism role they took on with their collective. Please, a warm applause. Elise, it's nice to be with you here on the stage. And uh, they gave us 20 minutes. It will take much longer, I guess, but they will give us a sign when it is over. I just saw in the movie in, uh, a poster you made. The whole street, the city was plastered with your work that you made together with Rob and Frank. It was the wallpaper of that time of the streets of Amsterdam. You were angry, right? Yes, but I first like to make an announcement that the other two members of Wil Plakken were Rob Schreuder and Frank Bekers. Right.
So tell me, why were you angry? Uh, well, the society was unjust. You saw it in the movie. There, was, there were very rich people and there were a lot more poor people. And especially there were people who had no sufficient housing and they came to us. And we had the means to support them by our graphic work. So our ambition to improve the world, because of that ambition we had, and we had individual reasons for that. Uh, okay. Yeah, John. <laughs> yeah. uh, so they well, knocked on your door and they say there will be an event next week. Can you make us a poster? And then you say, oh yes, we will do. And, yeah, and, and we'll do it in a hurry so that you can use it a few days before the event will uh, pass. It will, will, will happen, uh, I understand. Will happen, yes. sorry. Now, I have to believe that many people knocked on your doors, on the doors of Frank and Yeah, you, and you see all of those people around here. <laughs> so I was amazed, so I ask you in the, the talk we had, uh, in advance of this talk, like, how could you manage? How could you do so much? Of course, you were three people, but it was all over the place, and there were so much events in that time. Yeah. It was not only housing, it was like uh, layoffs, it was uh, events in other countries, political upheaval. Uh, if there was a problem, they found your door. Yes, we worked day and night, and afterwards we went dancing across the street. <laughs> so we, we had fun. As well, often. Yeah. And the work went on and went on and went on. We worked for the Communist Party, for the unions, for the women's movement, all kinds of actions. For, of course, you saw that in the beginning, the uh, people who had a housing shortage. That was a big problem. That was yeah, as well yeah, yeah. The, the biggest event. So I can yeah. remember that from my time, that uh, because that is also your time, that... Uh, that was all over mm -hmm. the place. So some, some events were also far away, like for example South Africa. So that was not in yeah. our streets, but the posters about it yeah. were we, actually there. We worked about 20 years for the Dutch anti-apartheid movement. So we made a lot, lot, lot of posters for them. We worked also for, that's not around here, because that was not really activism. So I didn't put them what in. What was not activism? <laughs> what well, what you topic? See, uh, you see the last page, the co last covers of the magazine screen. That's well. That, that's activism. I think we have to explain yeah. what screen was. It was a, a magazine yeah. for movie lovers. It tell, was reviews, yeah. and it was uh, first done. I tell you in a modernistic way. And then you guys came, and then it was party. It was a graphic big party, because it started yeah. to look like your posters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. F at first, the editors or the writers wanted it very neat, <laughs> although they wanted, how do I say, uh, to break into the way of seeing of their readers. And but why was that necessary? They were, were uh, in fact, a Marxist collective. I think they were inspired by Sergei Eisenstein, who was... He's a very, filmmaker yeah. who was very good in montage or introduced yeah, montage yeah, to yeah. the Russian movie. And yeah, they so admired him and they wanted... That to, to happen in the magazine their as well. magazine, although not in the layout. <laughs> But we so tried only for to the do cover it. and yeah. the back cover, because yeah, that yeah. were the biggest statements, I remember. Yeah. Uh, it was a beauty, so if you ever find such a magazine... Well, two covers pa just passed away. Okay. So now all these people come to your uh, desk and they ask you, and Frank and Rob, uh, uh, fix it, make it visual. But it was always negative in a way of we have to fight something, we have to uh, change the world. 
Is that not tiring in the end? Uh, yeah, yeah, it like, was fun as well. And what was the fun part about it? Making all those posters and and it was also the eureka feeling. We have had a good idea and then we put it onto paper and we went to the printers and it came from the presses and in thousands <laughs> in, a, in a print a run of thousands or two thousand, three thousand. That was exciting. One, one, yes, I can imagine. Uh, but they knock on your door, they say we need something. How does it work? Did you sit down with your two colleagues and make some sketches? You talk with each other? How, how was the procedure? Well, first you must imagine people come to your door and you agree with them. Otherwise you don't work for them. Uh, well, Philips phoned one day said <laughs> we do exist for 100 years do you want to make our yearbook and i had very polite i very polite had to explain well we we don't do it we don't do it no and rob said well my new car is gone <laughs> and i said you can't even drive <laughs> but well we don't Work for Philips. Okay. Uh, but where, where more people pushed out of the door? Is it only Philips or other companies? Uh, well, we never have worked for advertising. I don't think we still do. Not yet. No, okay. no. Okay. But they also never knocked on your door. So can you make a campaign for... Once, and then we got a row. So... We're not very fit for that kind of things. Okay, but let's go back to the way of working, because this is also hmm? for, uh, yeah. uh, for the young people uh, special, because there was not a computer. So you sit down and say, oh, this is great, we are with you. Then you take a pen, you make some sketches. Or no, the I... first must be an idea. And that's in a verbal way. Sometimes, but... Also, there are books and books of books with photographs. And you look at the photographs. What kind of books? What kind of photographs? Uh, with the... Um, Rectangular shape, black and white. I oh, don't the, know the, the contact English sheets. Word. Okay, yeah, there was a photographer, a photographer who makes photos. We all made photos. Oh, yeah, I know, I yeah, know. Yeah. And, then and you they make very good photos, because I would like to give you a cheer for that, because here's a fan of Will Pluckett, or Stick Whiteley, we have to say tonight. Um, but they, uh, you, you, you stage the photography, if yeah. I can mm -hmm. say it that way. Well, later on. But okay. we also made photographs, plain photographs. Okay. And we looked through the books, and then things fit to together. Happen. You have some text, you have an image, and you have your brain. And who wrote the text? The committee? The, the, Most of the, the time, the group? committee. Yeah. Okay. Then you start to put it together, and how does that yeah. work in a time there were no computers? Well, uh, yeah. scissors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so scissors. And that means, that means paper, and that yeah. means glue. Yeah. All right. So you cut some stuff, you uh, glue it down, and then you say, off to the printer. Yeah. All right, you well, still need well, some codes, that's I not remember from my that's own. simple. You first make a sketch about this big. That's always very beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> exactly how you want to have it. Okay. And then you have to make a working drawing. A, a mechanical a drawing, we call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then you have to put on all those letters, 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 letters. You have to cut them out. The letters, but will make the text in the end. Yeah, so yeah, what yeah, we yeah. see over here yeah. is often cut out yeah. from big These sheets. These are from the, uh, still from the Rietveld, made in the... The type shop, we call the it. The type yes. shop, yeah. 
It's that's easier. I, yeah. to, for the audience, I was as well a um, student of the night school uh, of the Reedsville, so I remembered, I recognized the letters that I played with when I was mm -hmm. a student, yeah. and they appeared in the streets of yeah. Amsterdam. Yeah. That's right. So then you make prints of that, you cut them out, you put them in the right position, yeah. and then you put the coats next to it, what color they would get, right? Yeah, but always the work of the, the drawing for the printers, yeah. it's too much letters, and the image is too small, and the sketch is always more beautiful. Mm, okay, can I? Yeah, that's always a bit of a disappointment. But you give an idea for the audience, like you will get somebody knock on your door, you will make a sketch together with Rob and Frank, then you make an agreement, you start to cut letters, you glue it together. Is it then in the end of the day done? And is it in the end of the day at the printer? And he will print the next day? Well, that's most of the time a necessity, because Two days later, the group who needs it, needs it. Okay. So we have to <laughs> stick it on the wall. And okay. next yeah. week is the demonstration, so it's all in a hurry. Did that add to the work ethics? Did that make it uh, better, that you have no time to doubt that it has to happen at the spot? Nowadays, I wouldn't say it made it better. It made it more urgent. I can see that in your work, yeah. and in your work, all what you uh, did as a... As Which a is better? One more time? Which is better? I don't know. I think I prefer to have more time, less text, and our own photos. <laughs> but that happened as well. Um, yeah, later on. <laughs> later on. So that I can imagine, so you, you make your thing, you quickly done, you see it in two days uh, all over the place, I have to say. Yeah. And then you can see the typos and the things that you would probably not like to have happen. Or, but yeah, but again, uh, of move. course there were some posters who did succeed. See, oh, it's gone already. Well, that's about how it was. <laughs> that one, we feel... We need it to make it, but it's maybe our worst poster. <laughs> but it had to be done. While working, there were some influences. Uh, hmm? You were influenced by the Russian constructivists. Yeah, that was a group of designers directly after the Russian Revolution. And they used photography and made collages with it and used all the texts in a diagonal way just as you see in our posters because we were influenced by them. And why did that happen? Because at the time that you were doing it in the 80s all these Russians were dead. Yeah, but we thought they had the same ideals as we had. We thought they are our, maybe it's not a good word, but forefathers. I get it. They so, also were fighting for a socialistic state. Yeah. Uh, so with that design or with that style comes in communism. So then if you work like that, I don't think that most of the people in Amsterdam knew that, but some art lovers could see this is a Russian style of mm. layouting. Yeah. You had no problems with that. Sorry? You had no problems or no objections to that? No, no, not at that time. <laughs> okay, okay. You told me as well uh, that when punk came around, that is a music movement, uh, they had a wild way of ripping paper and especially black and white, they said it was a liberation for you. Yes, because when I put together all these posters, well, it was very diagonal and <laughs> because it was spread out over a long time when we made it it's not exactly in the eye but you see there apartheid that was a poster after punk because you see the influence of punk because it's ripped. all ripped and okay, punk so was a liberation because we saw young designers or young people doing things which were impossible. They got a liberation 
They made strange magazines. We all bought them. You bought them? Yeah. And said Any? slowly goodbye to the Russians. They disappeared in a yes. shell. Okay. Still and admire them. I, they have done good and stuff. And the great yeah. photo montage is... If that's the right, right word, that's I'm word, not yes. sure. John Hartfield, buy his books. It's marvelous. <laughs> but slowly we developed an other style. Now, another question. You had uh, that movement and you were the, the visual, out you, you generate the visual output for all these pressure groups and leftist movements. Um, but at the same time, you were working for established institutes such as a museum. You yeah. made a stamp for the, the state, the capitalistic state. Mm. You uh, said, you said, okay, and yes to that. It yeah. was not but twisting things in your head. But uh, they gave us freedom, as you see, to still put our activists way of thinking in those designs. Otherwise, we probably not have done it. And then an institute such as the opera, what is very cultural. Yeah. So then you slip slowly into that world yeah. and said yeah. slowly goodbye to your wild young years. Yeah. Or do I see that this wrong? Of course had a bad ending. Tell me <laughs> or tell us about it. <laughs> well, our famous famous artist Robert Wilson, maybe you know him, <laughs> cut up our designs. He was he is the geographer of uh, Einstein on the beach. Right. Yeah. And he was in charge of the production, I guess, and you had to deliver that poster, the proposal yeah. to him and then he ripped it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, was he right? Was it a bad poster? No, it was a marvelous <laughs> poster for an opera by Louis <laughs> Andriessen. All right. Is it still, I hope to see it one day. Is, is the ripped poster still existing? Ripped by I don't Mr. know, yeah, I think so, okay. yeah. Amazing, <laughs> cool. Nice, nice. But of course that's, I think he was rather activi activist than we at that time. <laughs> because. And you have to believe that he is even visiting our country, so it was our tax money that he ripped. Amazing. Um, he, okay. That stopped because of that ripped poster, I guess? Or, uh, yeah, and he, we were an in-between uh, company because there was a new director and he wanted his own designer. Okay. So we were there for only two years anyway. Okay. Now we are so in the end of the age. We got a row, so okay. that's sure. <laughs> you continued. Uh, with working, it, it were beautiful uh, assignments, beautiful jobs. Uh, you succeeded mostly. Um, then also the computer came, I guess, in your mm. world. Did it have an influence on the visual output? Yeah, in a, at a certain time, because I was forced to use the computer, but in first. At first, we were against it because we thought a computer couldn't work. You couldn't work in a way we wanted to work on a computer, ripping uh, things. I agree. Yeah. But then, well, you see it, I got ill and my eyesight went diminished. Uh, diminished okay. So then, a uh, computer came in handy for me. I still say it saved my life, but that's a bit uh, too much okay. said. <laughs> You're still here. You're sounding well. Yeah. And then, well, I started to use the computer. And Maybe, okay, I'm happy that the computer saved your life and that you're still here and also <laughs> happy that you still make work because you do still yeah. make work. And it is maybe also a good thing that you are not that wild as you were once with your no. buddies. Um, what do you think, who took it over? Who, who is now the Young Turks? Well, we'll see them. Oh, they're here. Oh, that is nice to know. I think... 
Time for some questions yeah. from the audience. Thank you so much for this. Um, if you have any questions for uh, for Lise or even for, for Chris, mm -hmm. then yes. uh, please raise your hand. Uh, I have one burning on the tip of my tongue. Because when I was looking at the, the designs you guys made, uh, Lise, um, what I really noticed was, well, one, they're very colorful and very happy. Um, but also, there's a lot of humor, kind of sarcastic humor so, sometimes even. Um, why was that? What was your vision on using humor in your design? Oh, I think uh, otherwise it wouldn't work. If you are too serious, people don't get your message. So you have to use that humor to get through, right. I think. Okay. All right. Um, also, I was wondering, well, and again, if you have questions, even in Dutch, uh, that's also fine. Um, I was wondering, as you asked already, uh, Chris, who, who are the new activist designers nowadays? That, that's something we're going to find out later. But since there's also a lot of, well, maybe, I'm not sure, some young designers here tonight who may or may not see themselves as, uh, as activists, um, do you have any you know, tips or, or things you want to share with us, with, with them, um, for, you know, for their activist's career? Or um, Chris. Think Remember? for yourself. Yeah. That's a cliche. You should, everyone should do that. And, <laughs> and what, I, I think, what, uh, what, what do you mean with think for yourself? As in have a clear thing in mind? Or? Well, don't, <laughs> don't get too interf too, don't get too influenced by Facebook <laughs> or Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> use your hands as well, I think. Use your brain. Yeah. And uh, maybe scissors. I don't know. That's <laughs> some glue, maybe. <laughs> and and sometimes rip some stuff apart. Probably. Well, well, you don't have to. <laughs> you you have to do that as a young activist designer. <laughs> All right, well, if you don't have any questions uh, for now, then uh, Lise will all also be here later in the bar. So uh, a, a big applause for Lise uh, Ross. Thank you. Our next guest um, is co-owner of the creative agency Het IJzeren Gordijn, The Iron Curtain. Uh, he's an artist who, uh, whose work is expressed in, amongst others, painting, graffiti, graphic design, of course, uh, illustration and photography. Raoul Balai uh, was brought up in Amsterdam during the 80s and 90s. So basically, uh, when, when you were full in your career, Lies, uh, he, uh, he, he was growing up and was very much influenced by uh, the graffiti culture, hip hop and house culture uh, of that time. And I'm very curious to hear uh, what kind of role activism plays in his work. So please give a, a big applause for Raoul Balai. Thank you for the introduction. Hello. I just realized how influential Lise was for my bringing up in the 80s in Amsterdam because I never thought of it, but I know almost all the posters that came by. Um, as said, I'm an artist. I work as a, a contemporary artist. Uh, this is one of the works I do. Um, subject matter is clearer, I think. Uh, I do installation pieces like this. When you go inside, you come in a different world. So I'm a lot working with identity. Uh, how do we view each other? What is this Eurocentric? vision we have on the world. This is, for example, what always happens in my head when I think about the first man on the moon. Um, besides that, I've been running a graphic design company for the last 10 years called The Iron Curtain. Uh, we do branding, we do everything for NGOs, for more commercial parties like a beer brand, we do apps, sea contractors, everything. But then we got this client. 
I don't know who's from Amsterdam, but you probably know Balmer style, you know a few of their MCs and they've been really active. And what happened is this. Primitieve honden worden cultuur en die moet je doorbreken. Dat moet je hard aanpakken. Mensen uit die onderklasse moeten echt verplicht worden gesteld om aan het werk te gaan en op cursus te gaan. 40 uur werk, 20 uur cursus. Er is geen tijd meer om straat op te gaan. Geen gelegenheid meer om in die criminele cultuur te worden getrokken. So what we're actually hearing is someone from the municipality, a politician from their neighborhood, the Balmer, telling people that they have a caveman mentality. And these guys were just rapping and doing all this stuff, so they decided to go into politics. And they came to us for, well, a campaign. So we took the idea of their lyrics to make their campaign. So, open for discussion with the caveman, but also being willing to fight. All fists in the air. Take control. Combining it with a stencil kind of font and giving them the DIY mentality that hip hop has in its DNA. But what is activism? Because I was going through this and I was like, okay, but this is not really activism. These are guys who do hip hop and then were put in this position. So are they activists? Am I an activist? Well, I think people who think righteousness should be number one instead of legality are called or framed as activists. So we got Black Lives Matter, Paradise Papers, and hashtag Me Too. Really different kind of people, but are they all activists? Some people would say Black Lives Matter are, but Paradise Papers are journalists, and Me Too are women who out something that has happened to them, but they're not activists. Okay. So we can maybe say that they operate from an ethical framework or state of mind and take action. Um, next. Basically, it comes down to saying, we wouldn't do dot, 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 right? Right. So, we wouldn't do, right, let's play the game. We wouldn't do blackface, right? And this is where I would be called an activist. Swarte Piet is racisme. I don't know, anyone doesn't know the project? No? Okay. So, in 2010, we started out having conversations with a group of people, like 20, 30 people. Uh, actors, playwriters, artists, mainly creative people. And then, in 2011, this happened. On the left-hand side, we got Quincy Gario and we got Jerry Afria. They went to Dordrecht, got arrested on a rough, in a rough way, and every, everyone just saw that. In the meantime, we were also working at an exhibition called Zwart van Roet, Black off suit, not like suit, to make a point about what's happening. Um, for the people who don't know, still don't know, oh, one back. This is 1850, first time we see black people in the holiday. This is the black face we know from the Western world. This is Pete. If you don't know it still, look it up. Swarte Piet is racisme, look it up at Facebook. So they asked me as a designer to make a new logo, because the one on the left is used a lot, but where do we go with the designs? So, if we look at what's happening within this discussion, it's really important to see the history of uh, protesting. Because protests against this blackface tradition have, have been going on since the 20s or 30s in the 20th century. So what we did, we took all the um, older typography you see on the right, it's from the 70s and 80s, and made a new logo out of the old um, typography. And in the meantime, showing people that's not about Sinterklaas as such, but just about the character Pete and how he's dressed up, we still got him everywhere. So there's over a Sinterklaas, you got the moon shining through the trees, everything that comes from the lyrics, because we're not anti Sinterklaas, we're just anti blackface. Um, and then it gets interesting for me as a designer because. Every year this discussion changes, so you need to reach out to new people. So we came up with a new thing, and that's a party for all kids. It's a campaign just for schools, parents, so how do you go into this discussion on schools? So, uh, I don't know, what's the stuff in English? The rod, right? Okay, so you get the rod, and we still got the kids, you see the sooth on their face, and this is the, actually the way we're going now. This has been a campaign for two years. Um, and we do it in films as well. Mm -hmm. 
So it's interesting to play with all this imagery that's connected to the festivities. But at the same time, we need more aggressive stuff because we need to be protesting and all that stuff. So we also do KO Swarte Pete. And it's not knock him out, it's kick him out. So we've got the stickers going on, you can stick them on everything, and at the same time, you get all this different vibe, but same message, let's kick out Swarte Pete and keep Santa Claus. For me as a designer, it's... It's a nice thing to work on. I've been working on it for five, six years now, and it's you got to get up new things, new things, new things. Is there success with this activist movement? Well, this is Amsterdam this year. Uh, this is Nickelodeon two years ago. This is RTL. So we're getting there bit by bit. So if you can do anything about making it an inclusive party for anyone, help us out. So, we wouldn't do, right? That was the game we were playing. So, we wouldn't do Auswijs, right? So, then I want to know, uh, are there any people who have been living in this country for less than 20 years? Oh, yeah, quite a few. Okay, so let me explain. In the time Lis was operating, and the time I was growing up, asking a to someone was always strongly protested. Rightfully so, I think. But the connection was always made with the Second World War. Ausweis is your pass in the Second World War, where you have to show the Germans your Ausweis. Uh, but then in the end of the 90s, something happened, and identification became a normal thing. So that's one thing. But then we got biometrical uh, chips on the passports. And then me and a group of other creators were like, ho, ho, hold it, hold it, hold it. No fingerprints, no iris scan on my passport. Thank you very much. So we started the new empire. Uh, for the English speakers, Rijksoverheid is government. But if you just take Rijk, it's like empire in English. So they put in the fingerprints in the, in the passports and we came up with the new empire trampling on the civilians and everyone in the country. Uh, what we did, Godwin Alert. And Godwin Alert is a very funny thing because it explains you where our social state is at. Where is our mind at? Because if we see blackface, we don't have a problem with it. There's one reference to the Second World War. Everyone is on the back of their feet. We brought out this really pretty well done, if I can say so, folder from the Rijksoverheid, the government, telling people that they can get a free tattoo with their uh, burger service number. So that's the, your social security number, actually. We spread them in uh, the 70,000 pieces throughout the country, with much thanks to uh, several organizations and squatters. Squatters are an important thing of activism, always. Um, and we just took their whole design they got a special website. The government got a website. If you want to fool the government, go to their website. You can look up which font to use, how you should place your imagery. It's all there. It's great. Um, so we just we got a text writer, and they wrote, well, probably the best text the government wrote in years. <laughs> and people believed it. So we were thinking, this is going to take days. Maybe we'll, someone will pick it up. No, we were spreading out the folders, and it was already on the news. Um, everyone got into it. It's like lawyers, the government, the minister got into it. We got almost good. But did we have success? Um, well, if you if you follow the Slapenet, it's the yeah, it's a trawler wet uh, legislation in English. It's a bit sore English, but um, it's about privacy. The government will wants to have access to everything you got digitally, to your phone, to your computer, without asking, and not having any suspicion to you as civilian. So there's more awareness, but we didn't win the case with the fingerprints, because they were taken out, and now they're back in. Um, so, is activism needed? Well, we wouldn't do dot, 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 right? Right. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Uh, thank you so much, Raul. That was great, welcome. very inspiring. Um, just looking around if anyone has a question for Raul. Yeah, just hold on. I'm coming to you. The mic. Well, 
I like I like what you do, what you did, but you always have you think that the government is doing it um, on purpose to get the bad thing, but they want to keep the country safe. For example, tonight I read an article that Albania people from Albania they can change their name three times without problems. So how can the government protect their citizens against criminalism and, and other things? It's about against terrorism. You you act from the negative part of the government. Well, I don't see the uh, government as, as, as a bad thing, but I think you should be critical living in a country towards your government, especially when a government decides to put all our data in one place without uh, right legislation in place and the right people who have access to it. If we, got, if we look at the Second World War, we got a really good example here in Holland. We got all these registers and everyone registered where the Jews were living. Worked out fine, like Holland is the highest percentage of people who were taken to concentration camps of Jewish origin. And, and we got to learn from those things. It's not that government is bad, but we as civilians are living in a country. We should be really critical about what people think because they make mistakes. They're just humans. Um, going on on that point, which is also kind of interesting, um, is, is activism or, or, or an activistic um, campaign, should it always be you know, negative or used or with a negative message? Or is that something you, you work with, with your colleagues, you talk about like how are we gonna actually uh, give shape uh, this message? Is it always, as this uh, sir here says, that it should be from a negative perspective? No, I don't think so, but I think we got a different uh, challenge. Like in, in Lisa's era, there was mainly print. And now we get bombarded with images, with campaigns, with all these things. So you have to tickle people a little bit. And an easy way to tickle people is to piss them off. It's just like that. That's true. Another question from the audience. Yeah, just a moment. Thank you. Just like to say that I love your presentation, it was epic. Um, well, Thanks. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Wondering as well, what against the slave web and the decrease, decreasing in privacy that we have nowadays. Well, what's your standpoint on that? Well, I think the hard thing looking at that is the subject matter is already on the table. When we did uh, the new empire, there was no one talking about it. And that's the right moment for something like that that's really critical and really pushy. And I think right now it's about informing people about people know now, right? People know now that their privacy has to do something with the phone in their pocket, has to do something with data. Getting the message across with enough people is more important than starting a new, new campaign that kicks someone in the nuts, to say it really <laughs> gently. And uh, just to, to, um, to finish uh, your part of which I'm really interested in, is, is that you, you showed us a few examples of your work and you ended every time with success or not, right? Like, is, is it successful? Which kind of made me thinking, when is an activist campaign actually successful or when is it, when is it finished? So when do you take distance from the project and go on to the next? Well, it depends. Like with the new empire, we saw it as a fire starting campaign. So we started up and we let it go within a year. Like with, with the whole blackface drama going on for more than a century, we're going to sit this one out to the end. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on the project, but I think, and that's maybe also the graphic design and more of a bureau way of thinking about these things is, I see it as a campaign. So you work on a campaign, and you have to have success, so you have to reach people. And I think that's the first thing that makes it successful if you reach a lot of people. Thank you so much, Raoul Balay. Oh, I'm sorry, we have one more question. Are you ready for it? Just a moment, sir. In the beginning, you showed some pictures of your uh, commercial work, and that is paid for. And who is paying for your activism? Good question. Yeah. We need sponsors. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the, some people say, uh, like, don't you have everything, anything else to do than complain and you should, should work? Like, that's the thing with most activists. Lise also told she was working round the clock. And that's what we do. We just put in our own money, we put in our own time because we have to reach this goal. It's, it's, it's not like we're 
in it for the fun, I would go to Ibiza and have a cocktail if I would have the time and the money. And so, so if there are any <laughs> sponsors, know? then then meet Ro at the bar downstairs yeah. afterwards. I'll Thank you, you so uh, much, Ro Balai. <laughs> Our next speaker uh, is Roosje Klap, who, is, uh, who owns a studio for uh, uh, visual communication, mainly graphic design and typography. Um, together with Niels Schrader, uh, Klap is also head of the graphic design department at the uh, Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. Uh, some students there. <laughs> uh, and she works on numerous of projects in the cultural field for museums, galleries, art publishers, and, and also other artists. And tonight she will share her thoughts on the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights, uh, which will exist 70 years next year, I think, I believe. Roosje Klap, an applause. Let's see, I have some devices here to time, speak, and click. So, um, let's see, this was the classic thing. Um, I will first show you a movie. So what you just saw was a trailer of an algorithmic uh, uh, coded opera and um, it was actually uh, made something a little bit over a year ago when uh, we all speculated on yeah, the notions of Brexit and Trump um, and we all thought like it's not going to happen, you know, this is so ridiculous and it's all crazy. So we kind of uh, wrote this algorithm 
to, um, to speculate a little bit of what would happen if they would come uh, to power. And uh, what we did not know at the time, but we realized quite quickly, just weeks after its release, that um, this algorithm actually predicted a dark reality. Brexit became a fact. And Trump was chosen to be um, the United States president. And at the same time, our own Geert Wilders was also doing pretty good in the upcoming elections. So beginning March this year, when uh, I was uh, at dinner with my young children, and the elections in the Netherlands were upcoming, my, my children were actually quite frightened. They, um, we, had an, we had a conversation and they worried really about what was going to happen with our future and also about the headscarf of Kadisha in school or everything that Wilders and his people could maybe, um, could be changed when he would come to power. So, and like all mothers do, I, uh, I brought them to bed and I said, it's going to be fine. We have so many sane people around us. It's, it's going to be fine. We're not letting this happen to our place and time. But then I actually couldn't sleep myself because was it actually going to be fine? So, um, and I knew that 850,000 people, young people, 18 plus people, could vote for the first time in 2017. So it was the first time they could actually use their voice to vote. But we knew that not all of them would go out to vote. Um, in 2012, only 35% um, of those youngsters, they were entitled to vote, but they stayed at home. And so if they would all go to vote, then we knew that they would be able to choose for 13 seats in the House of Representatives. So I asked myself, shouldn't I do something about this? That same evening, I made um, 12 posters reappropriating Madonna's uh, lyrics to the song Vogue. And uh, I called out via my uh, social media channels to print and spread these posters, to hang them in the windows and to hang them in the classrooms or onto the streets. And with tw just 12 days, or in this case, as you see, nine days to go, um, in the run-up of the elections, I shared a poster, a different poster each day, which called to vote and spread the news. And so in the meantime, I started um, printing a lot of posters at the Jan van Eyck Academy on the risograph machine and at the silkscreen department in my academy in The Hague. Um, and um, I made a lot of things for social media, like uh, um, these are cover photos, but also for Twitter and for Instagram and to try and change all that because I wanted to sort of burst out of our own filter bubble. And it's quite difficult because, yeah, we're all in our own sort of uh, little you know, uh, utopia, I would say. Um, so I thought it'd be good maybe to wear it out on the streets. So I made, I presented this, uh, this uh, sweater and I thought if I can find 10 people that also want to wear this sweater, then I can print it. And um, so, I, and I put it on Facebook like anybody else wants this sweater because I really would like to do it and you can buy it for 50 bucks and then you can help me spread this news. Ladies with an attitude, vote. So within an hour, I had sold 35 of them. I jumped on the bike to H&M and I bought 35 pink sweaters or pinkish and some gray sweaters. And I went to the silkscreen printer. And the next day, uh, the happy buyers came to pick them up at my house uh, and brought them uh, all out through the country. And everybody shared all of them selfies uh, online with these, uh, with these sweaters. Some of them very famous and some of them less famous, but... Um, it was really something that kind of happened. And I also made uh, films to share. Uh, as Lise said, I uh, yeah, I didn't basically didn't sleep for 12 nights. Um, so everybody could share this thing. And um, I'm clicking, but it's going a little bit slow. Um, I also took uh, my children, the ones uh, that were talking about, like, is it going to be okay? I took them out on the street with those posters and taught them how to Vogue, obviously, because they had no idea what that was. <laughs> but now they do. Uh, and uh, I taught them how to do uh, some uh, wildplakken, because uh, that was, of course, really necessary. So we, we pasted that in the streets, in the Hague, and in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam. Uh, everywhere where it was possible, and we also went to the STEM locale uh, and pasted them there around. Uh, but also we went to Bos and Lomer because I actually thought we know that the people, yeah, that in our in Bos and Lomer we had a lot of conversations with people that say, yeah, what does my fucking vote mean? Nobody did, gives a damn about me and my group, and 
So we had a lot of really cool discussions. Also, my children had discussions, and, and yeah, they pretty much know how to vogue right now. Um, and it was and it worked. It was picked up really good by uh, by lots of social media channels, and uh, which was quite scary also somehow because uh, yeah I don't know all of a sudden I saw oh 200 new followers like it, within like 10 minutes something so somebody like the L had reblogged it or on the left Silverblau I never heard of this but she has 80,000 followers so um, yeah so then people started following me back um, and people were really sharing this uh, everywhere and it was really nice and also uh, small print printers out the marge like here Printroom in Rotterdam and uh, also Sigrid Kalon in Tilburg they printed it out as well and everything was shared and shared and shared and it was really cool because this is how my one woman campaign became a many woman and many people campaign. So after 12 full days not sleeping uh, and working, printing, pasting, the actual elections came. We voted. And then the results are known today with the party VVD leading the race and pleading just two days ago actually that we should kill all subsidies for artists because after all if you cannot um, you know, um, as we say, hold up your own pants, then you're not a good artist anyway. So obviously I really do not have the illusion that I can change, like really change anything to the general mood of the country. But with these simple means I have at my disposal, I've tried to make people uh, aware of the importance of at least doing something. Because by doing nothing, nothing will happen and nothing will change anyway. And um, yeah, so this lead, leads me to an, another project that we just started. Um, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. This is the first of 30 articles from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's adopted by the UN General Assembly on the 10th of December 1948. Indeed, next year, 70 years ago, as a result of the experience of the Second World War. And it was signed uh, by um, 48 countries um, back then, but also eight countries abstained from voting and haven't signed up till now, which was Belarus, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Saudi Arabia, Soviet Union, Ukraine, South Africa, and Yugoslavia, back then Yugoslavia. But the rest all agreed on some basic points for human rights that we should uh, 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 understand what these rights is and that the freedom is of great importance for a realization of this pledge. So when I was invited uh, this summer to make a contribution for um, the Taipo Yanchi Biennial in South Korea, I, um, I, I decided with my studio mate Pauline Le Pape, who is uh, also in the audience, hello Pauline, um, to make uh, three flags. Um, three flags who all carried out the complete universal declaration of human rights with those principles um, in all the colors of the nation states. And together, if you take out these white uh, corners, you can sew it together into a kimono and, and wear it. So we share this, uh, this well, design online and, um, and you can download it and you can print it and sew it together yourself. So you can wear out uh, these um, necessities for, for equality and freedom. And what to do with that was also, uh, we thought it'd be interesting to sort of, sh sort of celebrate uh, the human rights next year because it's 70 years ago, as I said, and it's still necessary because we spent our lives negotiating survival and also bodily integrity and humanity in the home, on the streets, in workplaces, at parties, but also on the internet. And indeed, uh, 70 years after its release, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is as urgent as it was then. So our kimono is on tour now. We, uh, we give it to people uh, to make photos with, to make work with, and um, here is the first. Here you see uh, the kimono sewn together. And this is a photo by Carmen Kemink, who, who captured Kurdish Rotterdam pop singer Nas, it's a really cool singer by the way, um, in our kimono. She was singing on her attic for three years uh, and her parents um, forbid her to sing, um, but she kept on singing and now she's a pop star because she kept on pursuing. 
Um, and also here are um, the, on the actual place or close to the actual place where the Stuxnet virus, computer virus was spread in Iran. Uh, this uh, artist duo, which I'm one of them, uh, we, took the, we took it uh, to there and we, uh, we made a photo series there with the flags and also a so-called cloud suit. And this picture is actually still illegal. It's uh, made by Vivian Sasse and she captured Indian supermodel Radhika in, uh, in India a couple of weeks ago. So, um, yeah, we just started this project, but I thought it'd be cool to share and also to, in the hope that if you want to do something with the kimono, let me know, because it's, it's there to use. Um, and I think it's important to sort of realize that, that um, ignorance is a sort of a form of tolerance. Um, like whether it's pretending to be in a colorblind society or, in, in, or one in which misogyny is some quaint old thing we've gotten over. And I hope this evening I'm able to make a sort of a brief plea for social connection, for meeting, for deregulation and differentiation. Because in my view, the artist or the designer should not create any midgetating circumstances, but must show the truth, the naked and painful truth. And we need to think and we need to react better. We must show solidarity and we have to let our voices be heard. And I think that must be done now because we're here now. And this is why I would like to conclude with a very small clip of my heroine, Patty Smith, during an interview with the Japanese television in 1978, a plea to embrace the now. This is my chance on the world. I didn't live back there in Mesopotamia. I wasn't there in the Garden of Eden. You know, I wasn't there with Emperor Han. I'm here right now, and I want right now to be the greatest time. This is my golden age. This is our golden age. I'm, I, I'm not there in the past. I'm not there in the future. I'm right here. And this is, when, this is the time to make it great. And if each generation would realize that the time to be great is right now when they're alive, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. The time mm -hmm. to flower is mm -hmm. now. Yes, yeah, Thank you, Lise Ross. We still have some time for a few questions for Rosha. Uh, there's one all the way in the back. I'm going to run. Hold on. No, that's going to ja, maar dan, dan word ik helemaal nerveus. Um, ik doe het in Nederlands. Ja. Want um, ik denk dat uh, Wilders zichzelf ziet als actievoerder. Dat denk ik. Uh, en ik denk dat zijn volgelingen dat ook vinden. En dat ook met name uh, vaak uh, uiten. Door zich af te zetten tegen uh, wat zij noemen de gevestigde orde. De grachtengordel. De hoogopgeleide mensen. En uh, nu zie ik uw uh, uh, vote-actie uh, in het Engels. Dat kan ik wel volgen. Maar ik weet zeker dat dat voor de meeste mensen die uh, Wilders aanhangers zijn... Uh, een bewijs is dat dat toch weer vanuit de groep komt... die hoger opgeleid is, zich beter voelt en dan. En mijn vraag is... Hoe bereikt u die mensen? U had het over Bos en Lommer. <laughs> die bereikt u die team mee? All right. Let me just quickly uh, translate for the people who are, who are non-Dutch speakers. Um, the sir right there had a very good question. He said, uh, your campaign was mostly maybe against Wilders, our infamous Dutch uh, politician. And he was wondering how your campaign, or, or if you thought about how to reach um, Wilders, who sees himself, uh, himself as an activist, and his followers see him as an activist as well. So how to reach uh, them, their, his followers? Mm. Right, well, first of all, I think uh, Wilders is probably an activist, but it's, he has his right to, act, to, to be an activist. It's all fine, I think, in that sense. And in my case, I thought it was very important to activate people to vote because to, to make sure that everybody rules in terms of democracy, that if we, can, if we can at least find a sort of democracy point there. But the question was not about that. The question was more or less that you see this as an elitist campaign and that it's very difficult to step down and reach to the people of Bos and Lomer. Well, the people of Bos and Lomer speak English, that's first. Um, and also, 
uh, I think also that um, I tried also in the form of the of the pop song of Madonna, which is yeah, for, is not very elite in that sense, to try and reach out in a in a level that is not intellectual at all. It was just a, it was really tried to to make a, a, a reach to to uh, every sort of um, way of society. I could also have done it in Arabic, but that's not the point. I think English is a sort of universal language, and yeah. Right, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to the next question right here. Hi. Sorry, I'm sorry. We have it by the bar again. Thank you so much. My question will be also about the vote campaign. Um, sure. I find it quite dangerous to uh, dismiss people's, especially young people's, disillusionment by the liberal representative democracies and to just lecture them to vote. So what I would like to suggest, would you consider having a follow-up campaign, especially maybe addressed to the post and Lomar youth as well, call, calling them to self-organize? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question and also a good remark, I think. It's, it is uh, something that, no, well, I think the Bosnian Lomar is a very good example because we, I met a, really a lot of people who said, like, they are not talking about me. The politics is not my politics. They have no right to say anything about me. But you know, we, you do. So it is something that you can change, right? So, and I, I do agree that that could be a, yeah, it could be a great idea to sort of try to make this community and to be active more in a political way or in a democratic way. But as I said also, I try to be super humble about this. I'm just a graphic designer. I don't know a lot. I, I, I know things with type and typography and posters. So this is the thing I got. And when I get angry, I can do this. This is what I can do. Um, any more questions from you guys? If not, I have a, a final question uh, for you, Rosje. Um, looking at, at your campaign and, and uh, the vote campaign, obviously, um, is, is your activistic work, is it always politically related or do you also find social or ethical issues um, something you get and, and, and make work about? Wow. Um... I think every act is political in in itself, right? So, in a way, if it's, yeah, <laughs> or maybe I don't understand your question. What do you mean? What is define politics? Well, for example, I think um, your vote campaign is really focused on a political mm. uh, uh, strategy, like getting people to vote to actually change something via politics. Uh, whilst, for example, uh, the Black Beat campaign. Yeah, it's in a way political, but it has nothing to do with the political system. Not per se. It, it comes from within, right? So I was wondering if, if you really focus on uh, change through politics or also different kind of change, social change. Well, I tell my children to shower less. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that you could focus on. So, and, I, and I think, as I said, I think inherently everything is in that sense an act of politics. But... Uh, not specific. I'm I'm not super political in that sense, or or, uh, um, and I get angry about a lot of things, also about tomatoes and cucumbers. So we can also talk about that one time, mm -hmm. but it's maybe right. another lecture. Cool. Uh, thank you so much, Rosh Klopp, for this, and a big applause for Rosh. We're going to our next guest, Yuri Fierman. Uh, Yuri, please come on stage. I'm gonna just introduce you while having you by my side. You're an independent artist, uh, uh, designer, and also performer. You live here in Amsterdam. Uh, and your work deals with a lot of things, but mostly um, around words, objects, and images that function as a bridge between the physical and the metaphysical, which I read on your website. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one of correct, the things- Correctly quoted, yes. Yes, yes. And one of the things I, I know, at least, uh, your work from uh, is, uh, put in a rainbow. I don't know if anybody here knows this work. Raise your hand. Put in a rainbow, a rainbow. Put in, put in, put in a rainbow. Yeah, uh, a really cool, uh, cool project, which I think you're also going to talk about, but also um, things like translating the Dutch anthem into Arabic and see what that actually does with, uh, with, with our anthem. So you're here also to talk about activism and I give you the floor. Okay, thank you. Hello. I, I wrote it down because they told me you have 10 minutes 
and I had a lot of projects that I thought uh, I could talk about. In the end, I chose four, but still, if you talk about four in 10 minutes, you have to be precise, so I'm going to start right away. So, uh, that's my name. I hope you can all read it. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, a, a few projects that I want to talk about that were important for my development as a designer to think about what design can actually mean uh, and also about what activism can mean. Um, 2006. Um, I was still studying at the HKU and I was doing a, a, a workshop. <laughs> HKU, yeah. <laughs> in the house, um, and the assignment was, um, can you use your influence as a designer to comment on a social issue? And I decided to comment on what was then a relatively new phenomenon, uh, the free newspaper. At that moment we had two, we had the Spitz and we had the Metro. Um, and well, of course the good thing about these newspapers is they were free, so people that normally wouldn't read were now reading. That's super. Uh, I think the, the bad thing was that they spent most of their effort in pleasing the advertisers. Uh, so the articles consisted mainly of standard uh, A and B coverage, just copy-pasted articles, while advertisers got a lot of freedom uh, to experiment with this new format, including, well, special covers that were wrapped around the actual newspaper, like here, this beautiful sloggy ad, which looks like an actual cover. Um, and it, yeah, it bothered me that now many young people were confronted with this new format that um, for them, since they didn't read any other newspaper, was the new standard. Um, and in the end, these newspapers, they're basically a way to show you advertising with news as a byproduct. So I thought that was a pretty bad standard um, for young people. So... Uh, as a response, I created a scenario where an advertiser would push it too far, and I called it the Metro True or False Edition. And I think I, I should actually do it again now that the whole fake news thing is uh, such a hype. And in this edition, I said that the editors of Metro uh, made up three articles, and if you could spot them, then uh, you could send in the headlines of these three fake articles and you could win an iPod Nano. So, um, with the help of some friends, I pasted this sticker onto uh, 2,500 metro, metro newspapers and put them back in the original distribution spots. So, uh, yeah, that day every person that picked up this special edition had to guess, like, is this a fake article or is this a fake article or is this a fake article? Um, and, yeah, the next day uh, on, the, on, on their front page they had to put up this message that, uh, well, there were no fake articles but instead the, the sticker was fake and you, could, you couldn't win an iPod Nano. Um, <laughs> And yeah, it, uh, this was 2006, so I, I was in the second year of my study and it was really cool to see that I could influence the way that people view their environment with super simple means. And these means in this case were just stickers and the help of some friends. So this really gave me um, a boost. Um, in 2008, so this was my uh, fourth year of studying, I uh, qu quit my studies at the HKU for one year to go on a trip with two classmates. Here's uh, one of them. Um, and we formed a design collective called ISMA. And basically we, we asked ourselves, um, can we be graphic designers without a client? Or can we be our own client? Um, and can you see your environment as a briefing? Can your environment ask you something if you look closely? Um, and to find that out, we, we bought this uh, van, um, and we drove to a place that we had never been before, in this case Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia, um, to simply look around a new environment um, and see what it asked of us. And the first thing we noticed was um, a lot of giant mural paintings, so again, advertisements, uh, that cover the sides of big apartment complexes. Um, oh. And... I mean, these are painted, so they're, uh, they're, they're executed really beautifully. Um, uh, as, a, as a craft, I can really appreciate this. Um, and also, uh, they, they, they give the environment some color. Um, but at the same time, of course, these messages have no relation to their environment at all. 
And yeah, some of them also really created a cynical contrast between the shiny image and a worn down building, and especially with, with, with this ad, which is basically a suggestion with the rest of the building. Like you can even see the, the scars of the war still, still present on the building. Um, so we wondered if we could do the same, but then in a different way. And we found this apartment complex, and because uh, we got subsidy, it was the first time in our lives that we had subsidy from the Fonds Bay Café Bay, which then still existed. So um, we bought uh, one side of this apartment complex for uh, 1,250 euros. Um, we interviewed the residents of the building, and based on the stories that they told, we made several designs, and we had them pick their favorite design. And the design they chose was um, based on a quote of one of the residents. We, we asked them, so what do you actually think of all these giant advertisements in the city? And she said, well, whatever you write on a wall, people won't care. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we glorified her cynical remark and turned it into a democratically chosen mural. And... Um, Last uh, winter, I, I, I went back to Sarajevo to, to visit some friends that I made at that time. Um, and it's still up, it's still there. So this is, uh, this is um, uh, almost 10 years later. And so apparently people respect uh, this, this wall painting. It was pretty cool to see. So um, because of this different approach, I also get approached by different type of clients. Um, and in 2013, together with Brigitte van den Berg, who is uh, one of... The, the, the people of my former collective, we're not a collective anymore, um, we got approached by COC, which is the, the Dutch gay rights organization. And their briefing was, um, so Russia um, recently passed a gay propaganda law, which pretty much means that now suddenly the rainbow flag is propaganda and Putin is coming over to have dinner with Rutte. Um, so this is a pretty bad situation, could you make something um, that uh, responds to this? So um, this uh, was our response, um, and not, not only this image, we uh, created a website, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, the, the best, uh, one of the best word jokes in my career, uh, uh, putinarainbow.com. And uh, so we, we asked other people, uh, please send in your images where you combine Putin with the rainbow. And yeah, we, we just used a sim simple <laughs> Tumblr website, and to, to me, the, the beauty was that we only designed the grid, and everybody else could send in their images. And <laughs> the, the, the nice thing is, if, if you work with universally recognizable symbols, like uh, Putin uh, and the rainbow, um, everyone almost... <laughs> Everyone on the planet gets this joke. So uh, that means almost everyone on the planet can participate. So we got um, many different submissions. Most of them were from Holland and Russia. And um, many of them went viral. Um, this one is by Ruben Pater, by the way, who's going to give the, the column at the end of the day. And... I mean, also, it was just great to, to, um, to have this website and see all these wonderful submissions come in. We had a lot of fun, and um, some images were so strong that they became icons in themselves, and they were later reused during protests. This image was used a lot during protests against the Sochi Olympics a year later. Um, so, yeah, I thought, wow, this, this work can just go its own way without me, without me being the director. Um, and I thought that was actually a really nice um, characteristic for the work that you make, that you don't have to uh, deal with it all the time, but it just goes its own way. Um, this uh, image is now um, on, a, on an extremist list. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a banned image um, in Russia. And of course, I, I always look back at these campaigns and, and like you, you question yourself, what does it help? What does it solve? And I think... Um, of course, uh, a campaign like this is not going to change that law, but uh, it did get the attention of a lot of press for the situation. Um, and 
yeah, I also think it will change the way that Vladimir Putin will be remembered. So, um, then uh, a year later, thanks to this Putin campaign, um, I was asked to work on another project, and this time it was by Setup, which is a um, yeah, media lab in Utrecht. They uh, basically work with tech and new media and internet and how this affects our daily life. And they hooked me up with a journalist, this is not us, this is just some kids, and uh, uh, Dimitri Tokmetsis, and they asked us to create a, a campaign about digital privacy. And uh, basically to warn people what can happen when you upload personal information on to the internet. And this this idea of this privacy that we're losing, I think it's one of the most important and at the same time ab abstract uh, problems of our time. It's very hard to notice what it means to lose your privacy. Um, so on, on, on Flickr we found these um, photos uh, that had a specific license, you can, you, you can choose to copyright your photos, but these photos had a Creative Commons license that allow commercial reuse. Parents uploaded them, they probably chose the wrong license or they didn't even know that they had an option. Um, and so uh, we took advantage of their lack of knowledge by using these images for our web shop Copy Copy um, with the slogan, uh, someone's kid on your favorite mug and we decided to uh, sell mugs with pictures of other people's children on them for only $15.95. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? Um, and so we sent out a press release. Um, it was picked up very quickly and very well uh, by national uh, media such as uh, Omroep Max and Koffie uh, uh, um, which, like, without being uh, funny about it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy that we made a campaign that was so easy to... Uh, explain that it could just be covered by any news format from Coffee Tide to CNN. Um, and the funny thing is, uh, I'm, I'm, I am not a tech expert. Uh, I do design and I think about reframing popular images or subjects in a different way to give them a new meaning. Um, but I, I still get asked a lot. This was just last month. I was on Croatian national television telling people about the, the dangers of uh, uploading your information online. Um, and yeah, so, so this does really show me that translating a complex subject into a simple story or a simple image can have a lot of power uh, and allows me to um, spread the story to many people. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Take some time to think about that. I will start with the first question. Um, I'm looking at your work and it's, uh, well, not all of it, obviously, but uh, a lot of it is, is in a way online or it's made offline and then uh, being put on, uh, on the web and also being produced, uh, not, not produced, but being spread out online. Um, do you also make... Uh, uh, campaigns like fake online campaigns as something you mentioned earlier the trolls now with Russia uh, is is that something you are working on or you're wanting to work on as an as an activist designer uh, to, to me I um, I never think about wanting to work with a certain medium. Uh, yeah. I don't care about uh, making, making something for the internet or a book. I care about the subject and I look at the subject closely and try to find the answer within the subject. And where does the interest for the subject begin? Um, well, my, my interest is, is, is symbols. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like these because they have this link between a really complex idea of what is a country and a really simple representation, red, white, blue. So I like this strange friction. Uh, but then again, uh, I get approached by uh, COC and they say, uh, uh, do something with Putin or a setup, they say, do something with digital privacy. So then I am, uh, uh, um, I'm just as happy to, to work on another subject. As, as long as the question is a beautiful question. As long yeah. as the question is a beautiful question. Speaking about questions, there's one all the way in the back. Uh, I was wondering, every campaign you do is humoristic. 
in sort of form? Is that something that is always uh, needed for you when you do graphic design and activism? Um, well, I, I, th I thought about this activist thing a lot. Uh, I don't uh, call myself an activist. Some of my work definitely is activistic. Um, but at the core, I'm a, I'm a maker, a designer or an artist. And I think there should be beauty in my work. Um, and uh, also what uh, Lise Ross said, that's how you reach people. Um, so um, I think that's, that's important. It, it's, um, I think before you understand what it's really about, you get the joke or you see a certain form of beauty. And I think the, these things can be, can be universal. So it's a really easy way to just reach someone. Uh, and then as soon as they're in, then they have to figure out what the message actually is. And I like that. And as a final question for you, Yuri, um, is there something you can share with us, something you're working on right now, like a sneak peek of some new uh, work that is obviously mm. activistically or related to activism? Well, the, yeah, the, the, there's, 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 a, um, there's one big idea that I would like to do, and that, that is to organize... Um, a grand slam in semiotics. I would really like to uh, to organize a, a big tournament where there are like two people on a uh, uh, on a on a field and they have to completely deconstruct uh, a symbol uh, and the and, and the one with the best explanation wins and there will be a judge and there will be a jury and I think it will be a really interesting way to uh, to sum up this whole schizophrenic conversation we're having about identity now. But yeah, that's. Uh, One, one day. In the future. Juri Fierman. Our closing tonight will be held by uh, 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 Ruben Pater, who will uh, uh, do that in a form of a column. Um, and under the name Untold Stories, he creates visual narratives about geopolitical issues, mostly. And he interprets the role of a graphic designer as an active and critical, uh, critical citizen who has the agency to communicate effectively through uh, that work. Um, his well-known drone survival guide um, received wide attention in 2013 as an educational tool uh, for drones, uh, functioning as a political statement mostly. Um, tonight he will give us a perspective on what design activism is, but also what it will mean in the future. Please give a round of applause for Ruben Pater. Good evening. Uh, so we already saw so much great work and visual power, so I'm not going to show any work. <laughs> Sorry for that. It's also first for me, but I also think it's like a very um, difficult topic. I think it's also very important to be specific about it. So I uh, wrote the text I want to read. Um, And this text is about the fact that we might say that activism is back. Um, at least according to Marcus Fares, uh, he was the first international ambassador of the Dutch Design Week this year. And he wrote this article called Can Designers Save the World? In which he says, issues such as climate change, refugees, pollution seem to be defeating governments, global agencies and other organizations that are supposed to find solutions. While Donald Trump is single-handedly reversing progress on many of the issues designers care deeply about. So, can designers step up to the challenge? So, activism is back, apparently. Actually, I've noticed this myself. Next week, I'm invited by the HKU, Utrecht School of the Arts, to do a lecture about activism. The Design Department of Art School in Zwolle invited me to speak in an event about the year's theme about revolt. Um, Stedelijk Museum had an exhibition last year titled Dreaming Out Loud about designers that face the problem of our times. What Design Can Do is a festival for social design that organizes a design challenge uh, since two years for pressing issues such as the refugee crisis and climate change. Uh, the, the festival Graphic Matters was this year all about activism with a large exhibition of protest posters, you, you all have the book, uh, peace flags and a large inflatable refugee in the st streets of Breda. 
And the Museum Boymans van Burning in Rotterdam currently has an exhibition called Change the System, actually featuring also a work of mine, uh, of which Boyman says, the designers in the exhibition present modest solutions for today big problems. So, so I want to talk a little bit about why is this new interest in activism? Um, is the world really such a bad place right now compared to other decades, compared to when Lies Ross was uh, designing? Are designers more politically active than before? Or is this just a trend? Is it a way to introduce subversive ideas and aesthetics that can be successfully incorporated into the latest products that can be sold to politically engaged citizens? In order to understand this, let's start with what activism in design means. So if I look up activism in the Oxford Dictionary, it says the policy or action of using vigorous campaigning to bring about political or social change. So the purpose is clear. Activism uses whatever means necessary to achieve its goals. Graphic design is the art or skill of combining text and pictures in advertisements, magazines or books. So that's a bit outdated from the Oxford Dictionary, so let's add websites to that. So activism and graphic design must mean to combine text and pictures in advertisements, magazines, books, or websites to bring about political or social change. So I think this is the kind of work that we see in the 20th century. We've seen these great examples from uh, Lise Ross with Wild Plakken, uh, but also people like Tibor Kalman, Sheila Lefrente, Brad Field, Barbara Kruger, Emery Douglas, many of the famous designers of the 20th century. Uh, and this kind of design of activism has proved itself. But as Raoul said, today now we have memes, video blogs, document leaks, fake news campaigns, troll farms. So somehow designing a political poster or a new symbol does not just have the same effect. So what's the new kind of design activism? So this brings me back to Marcus Fares from uh, the DZ magazine. During Dutch Design Week, he introduces the next step in design activism in what he calls the Good Design for a Bad World Initiative. Design that not just brings attention to social, political, or economic issues, but presents solutions. So what Fares says is designers will have to push at the boundaries of what design is, seeking solutions not to just the issues mentioned, but also to intangible problems such as how to fix democracy, how to make society more inclusive, and how to help people overcome irrational fears of immigrants. So during the Dutch Design Week, Fares organized a series of design talks with topics like this. So climate change, pollution, politics, the refugee crisis, and terrorism. So I'm going to read some things from the, the website of the talks that went on during the Dutch Design Week. So when the talk about terrorism says, terrorists are turning vans and trucks into weapons and targeting urban spaces. How can we design our terrorism without ruining our cities? And to what extent is vehicle design and urban design making things too easy for terrorists? So some of the examples they present are anti-terrorist robots and flower pots that can stop terrorist attacks using trucks. The one on the refugee crisis says, how can design, architecture, and urbanism help, my, help make life easier for refugees and host communities? Can design help prevent population movements in the first place? Should refugee camps be considered as proper cities rather than transit zones? So one of the designs they show as an example is the wearable habitation coat, which is a baggy parka that can tr transform into a tent or a sleeping bag. Politics. Over the last... Uh, over the past year, widespread discontent had le has led to the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump. Can design address the causes of this discontent? Of the designs, uh, one of them is from a Dutch designer actually called the New Vote, which is a way to make democracy more modular using a digital system. The designer says himself, the political system is broken. Democracy needs a redesign. So... Uh, why, I, why I'm talking about this is that uh, apparently to some uh, designers, the new way of design of activ activism is coming up with solutions for complex issues. So this, of course, demands a lot of knowledge and is, has a lot of responsibility. I think we should ask ourselves if we are, are perhaps overestimating what design can do about these issues. Flower pots will not stop the threat of terrorism any more than a parka, which transforms into a tent, will solve the underlying problems which causes people to flee their home countries, like war, famine, inequality. A new dig digital democracy does not solve the discontent which is felt by millions of voters. 
So aside from these particular examples, I mean, these designs might be really good for many reasons, but I would not call them activists. Because they don't actually want to change anything. They just want to address symptoms that are related to larger issues. I think it's more what Yevgeny Morozov calls solutionism in Silicon Valley. He says, the recasting of all complex social situations as neatly defined problems with definite computable solutions. You could also say computable, you can also say designed. So this quest is likely to have unexpected consequences that could eventually cause more damage than the problems they seek to address. So he, re he, he actually relates to Silicon Valley, but I think it applies as well to design. Because let's give an example. How can design with good intentions have bad consequences? So imagine you want to address climate change, particularly the air pollution caused by car and industrial exhausts. You design new stylish breathing devices that allow people to go outside into smog and make a fashion statement. What could possibly go wrong? Well, first of all, exhaust from cars and industry will not diminish. Rather, it could become normalized because people get, to, get used to wearing breathing devices in the first place. Why do something about pollution when people can protect themselves by buying products? Secondly, better and more luxurious design devices will be more expensive and poorer people will have to buy cheaper versions or do without. This could result in a climate class system where governments leave protection against pollution to the market. Rich people are, poor, uh, uh, rich people are healthier, poor people get sick and live shorter lives. Second example. You want to help refugees get better access to services in their host country while getting updates on their citizenship application status. Good idea, right? So you design a smart card for refugees that is a kind of ID, which also allows them to use public transport, go to the library, keep their medical records, and check their citizenship status. Sounds wonderful, but if you think a bit longer about it, doesn't this create a digital surveillance system for refugees? If the government decides to track down all refugees and deport them if we get a different political system, the ID guard is the perfect way to do it. This goes back to the point Raoul was making about the World War II registration service. Also, the government can monitor the behavior of all refugees, where they travel, if they are breaking the law, if they are sick. The card can be used to control and surveil refugees continuously. So without realizing, you have created an ID card for refugees which discriminates them also from Dutch citizens, creating a second class um, um, citizen ID card. So if you show such a card, everybody will know you're a refugee. Actually, both examples are not hypothetical. They are both nominees of the What Design Can Do uh, design challenge. Um, so I don't want to talk about here about the quality of the products or the attention of the makers, because I believe they have good intentions. But they are just to show that design with good intentions can have damaging consequences. And that negative outcomes uh, are easily overlooked. Um, so coming up with design solutions for social or political issues is not just impossible, but also possibly dangerous. What adds insult to injury is that we have to acknowledge designers also profit from these social and political issues. For example, the last decade in the Netherlands, we have seen a privatization of healthcare, child protection, social work, and homeless shelters, while at the same time their budgets, ha budgets have been slashed. So while we are the eighth richest country in the world right now, the amount of people in debt, people in poverty, and homelessness is rising since 2008. But all these new privatized institutions need logos, more work for graphic designers. A lot of the money that used to be spent on these social programs has been reverted towards security. And since 9-11, the fear of the other has allowed politicians to massively invest in dragnet surveillance, border walls, face recognition, drones, predictive policing, and smart surveillance technologies. Our fear of terrorism has created a thriving security industry that's quickly growing. Systems, apps, websites, programs have to be designed, uniforms, interfaces, visual identities. So I think we should be watchful of framing design as good and the world as bad. I think there's good and bad design, just as there's good and bad in the world. Um, so first of all, let me state that I do believe many designers want to contribute to a better world, and I would highly uh, recommend that. I think there's a lot of potential at this moment that we can harness. Designers no longer want to be passive, but actively involved. But if coming up with solutions for social and political issues is not the new form of design activism, then what is? I think we should start by leading by example. We can start by showing that the design industry is a social responsible industry. 
we can stop doing products that harm the environment. We can stop doing unnecessary print work if we can make digital work. We can use print techniques that are harmful, stop using print techniques that are harmful, and maybe that beautiful book you want to make should be an e-book or should not be made at all. You can refuse to work for clients in polluting industries. You can refuse to work for clients that build surveillance or military equipment, clients whose products are built with racist and sexist stereotypes, clients you, are, you feel are morally at odds with what you believe in. But we also have to stop with unpaid internships, pay better wages, stop with forced overtime, work towards better contracts for designers, not just flex contracts. Also demand that the designers are paid better wages, that we refuse to do free labor and refuse unpaid design competitions or pitches in Dutch. We can stop outsourcing printing to low income countries, pay better wages to typesetters, programmers, binders, printers, illustrators, photographers, so make sure that the supporting industry for design is socially responsible as well. And I think it's also really important that the design industry should become a better reflection of society. More than 60% of design students are, are female, but in conferences, awards, exhibitions and juries are still dominated by white males. Minorities are heavily underrepresented in graphic design in the Netherlands. We should actively look for talents in minority communities and help them find their way to design schools. Invite voices from different cultural backgrounds into the design world and decolonize our design education by learning from non-Western design histories and practices. So, mean that all of us have to sacrifice something. Some of us will have to make a little more money a little less money. Some of us will have to give up a position in a jury or refuse to participate in an all-male panel. Some of us have to choose not to design when we are asked to. Some of us will have to do less print work, switching to digital media for the benefit of the environment. Some of us will lose clients because they're involved in unethical behavior. But um, I think without sacrifice, there is no activism. If I think about activism, I think about Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, Boney, Patrice Lumumba, Mohamed Mossadegh, Steve Biko, Pussy Riot, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning. Uh, these people sacrificed. And that gave their freedom or even their life. They gave even their freedom or their life towards equality, justice, and solidarity for all people around the world. So I'm not asking you all to become activists, but I think if you uh, think about what these people did for us, then sacrificing some of our privileges as designers doesn't seem that much to ask. Thank you. Wow, that was a very powerful closing of, uh, of this inspiring evening where we learned amongst others that um, Activist graphic design is working uh, around the clock. Um, it's sacrificing a lot. It's uh, doing things from the heart, doing things, doing things with paper and scissors and shredding things up, or maybe not doing things at all, like we just learned. Um, I want to thank our, our wonderful guests for uh, tonight and for their input. I want to thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, and I also want to show you um, something we have, uh, which is quite new, but um, it's called the Pay As You Like Principle. Um, it's because our activism uh, uh, here at Pakhuis Weiger is that we believe that we really want to make these programs accessible for everyone, and that's why we uh, we uh, it's a freely accessible event. But um, we would really like to ask you to show your appreciation for the program you saw tonight by going to zwijger.nl slash pay. The link is uh, right there below. Um, making it possible for us to, uh, yeah, to keep making quality programs uh, here at Pakhuis. Um, check out our website for other interesting uh, events coming up real soon. And uh, we will hope to see you at the bar for some drinks and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>